Please join me in welcoming Adam Liao to the stage to deliver the 2023 Sir Edward Weary Dunlop Asia Lecture. Thank you, Asher, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's an honor to present, be presenting this lecture on Gadigal land tonight. When Asia Ling first asked me to deliver tonight's Sir Edward Weary Dunlop lecture, I was a little bit shocked. This is usually performed or delivered and presented by former prime ministers, governors, foreign ministers, some of the most influential and important people in this country. And tonight, you're getting the guy who cooks noodles on the telly. Sir Edward Dunlop was an inspirational leader, a surgeon, war hero, prisoner of war, former Australian of the Year and a former Wallaby. An extraordinary list of accomplishments affirming his famous nickname, Weary, coined from the 1920s slogan of Dunlop tyres, they never wear out. Despite this list of his accolades, it's perhaps the description of him offered by one of his soldiers who served under him as a POW in Burma, the author Donald Stewart, that summarises his legacy best. Stewart described Dunlop as a lighthouse of sanity in a universe of madness and suffering. Researching Dunlop's past, I realized a small piece of overlap with my own. He'd been imprisoned by the Japanese in Singapore's Changi at the same time as my own grandfather, a British colonial in Singapore at the time of occupation. For my grandfather, I'm told he never truly recovered from his time in Changi and ultimately he died relatively young. I never got to meet him and I don't know if he ever made his peace with his one-time captors, but I sometimes wonder what he'd think of his grandson speaking Japanese daily with his great-grandchildren or working with the Australia-Japan Foundation on the friendship between our two countries. It might have been a future that he thought impossible. My grandfather died long before seeing Singapore or Australia at peace with its neighbours in Asia. Dunlop endured hardships as a POW that many of us can barely imagine, but his experiences seem to have inspired him. Associated with the Colombo Plan, he promoted the training of Asian medical personnel in Australia and was an active member of the Asia, Australian Asian Association of Victoria. In 1969, he led an Australian surgical team to Vietnam. And in 1972, he was made an honorary fellow of the Indian Association of Surgeons. Dunlop harbored little hatred for his former captors. He forgave them, becoming a leading figure in promoting reconciliation with Japan. It's quite easy to say those words as a line in a speech, but what kind of a man does it take to see your friends brutalized or killed around you and to have every reason imaginable to hate and instead to choose a path of reconciliation? The Second World War was a long time ago and our relationships with our Asian neighbors are very different indeed. Today, Australia has no closer friend in Asia than Japan. I'm a cook. I don't profess to be an expert in diplomacy, politics or economics, but I do think I understand food. To understand food isn't simply a question of culture and chemistry or two parts flour, one part milk. The dishes that end up on our dinner tables each night don't get there by accident, nor even really by preference. Food tells a very honest story. I argue that spaghetti bolognese is Australia's national dish, and there's no dish more universally cooked or loved in Australian homes. I write more recipes than quite literally anyone in the country, more than 500 a year. And the accepted wisdom in my industry is that people look for recipes that are fast, easy, and don't produce a lot of washing up. So how is it then that our most popularly made dish is one that requires finely chopping a dozen ingredients, simmering it for hours, and perhaps two or three very large pots? We tell ourselves that we want quick and easy dishes, but spaghetti bolognese is popular because it has attributes that fit with Australia like a jigsaw piece fits into a puzzle. Waves of post war migration for southern Italy brought inspiration. Chinese market gardeners predated that by a century, ensuring that we already grew fresh garlic and onions. We have a beef industry providing affordable mince, a Mediterranean climate across much of South Australia and Victoria that provides olive oil and tomatoes. South of WA is covered by a wheat belt su uh, su suited to the production of dried spaghetti and in 1901 we federated as a nation, meaning that ingredients from one part of the country are ready available, readily available all over it. In terms of lifestyle, we have a five-day work week and our Christian Anglo-Saxon economic structure discourages employers from having us work on Sunday. So we have a whole day to simmer ragu and pack it up for a week. Quarter acre blocks means we have big kitchens and big fridges, so freezing extra bolognese is no problem for Australians, even if they fit, wouldn't fit in your average European or Asian fridge. 
Mums and dads today grew up in the 70s and 80s when our average household size was 3.5 people and many families fed five or more every night. And that's the perfect strike zone for an affordable batch of bolognese. In 2023, our average household size has dropped to less than 2.5 and the footprint of our kitchens is shrinking as well. Based on these metrics alone, I can say with a fairly high degree of certainty that if bolognese is our national dish today, which I believe to be true, it will not be in a generation from now. I imagine this is a fairly more in-depth analysis of spaghetti than you were expecting <laughs> to get this evening. <laughs> but before I was a cook, I was a lawyer, and before I was a lawyer, I was a scientist. Applying a scientific or forensic analysis to the attributes of Australian life and history, a knowledge of natural selection, not that it, as it applies to biology, but to systems and processes. Game theory, if you had never heard of spaghetti bolognese before, and understood nothing about its preparation, you could still extrapolate with surprising accuracy that our most popularly cooked national dish would have all the attributes that we find in a good old spag bowl. I recently traveled the country filming a series for SBS about finding our national dish, and among hundreds of suggestions that have covered everything from chicken parmigiana to laksa and fur and Mongolian lamb, we only had three people say that it was spaghetti bolognese. We had hundreds tell us it was meat pies. And that's despite the fact that few of us have ever made a meat pie, and I'd wager that it's been some time since you even last ate one. They're a bakery and service station favorite, but even the retail numbers show us that sausage rolls outsell meat pies by some margin. <laughs> now this has nearly nothing to do with diplomacy or foreign affairs. <laughs> but what a discussion of our national foods does tell us is that as a nation, we actually don't know ourselves very well at all. And if you don't know yourself, it's very difficult to build healthy, productive relationships with others. All nations are in the business of myth-making. All nations tell stories about themselves. Myths can take a long time to dispel, and if we choose to ignore the fact that they're myths in the first place, they can persist forever. We tell ourselves that Australia is a nation of pie lovers, but in fact, we're bolognese slurpers. And the fact that sausage rolls outsell meat pies is an uncomfortable truth that we really don't know what to do with. Especially with regard to our history in Asia, our relationships in Asia in the present day, the myth-making of the Australian story has done us a grave disservice. Nearly 30 years ago, Pauline Hanson warned in her maiden speech to Parliament that we would be swamped by Asians. To this day, I'm confused whether she was most confused, concerned by Japanese 20-somethings picking fruit in the Byron Bay hinterland, or Thai restaurateurs making crispy barramundi. Perhaps she was worried we'd all band together and build another overland telegraph. I try to make light of it now, but I was a teenager at the time, and that speech caused a lot of problems in my very multiracial and multicultural family. Screams across the dinner table, tears. The impact it had on me as an Asian Australian should be obvious by the fact that I'm bringing it up now 30 years later. That speech was an important one, however, because it illustrated all too clearly how the tropes and biases of our past color our discussion today. Not far from here in the State Library of New South Wales, there's a copy of a pamphlet written in 1887 entitled The Chinese Question in Australia. It was authored by Chok Hong Chong, Lo Kong Meng, and Louis Amoy. These were some of the most prominent Chinese Australians of the 19th century, Victorian citizens, extraordinarily wealthy by every measure of the day. Chok Hong Chong was a Christian missionary and property investor. Lo Kong Meng and Louis Amoy were merchants who, among many business interests, started the Commercial Bank of Australia, which ultimately became Westpac. Written in response to rising anti-Chinese sentiment, it's an extraordinary document that touches on international law, history, philosophy, and religion. It's one of the earliest Australian documents making an appeal for human rights. In part, it reads, you do not endeavor to exclude Germans or Frenchmen or Italians or Danes or Swedes. There are men of all these nationalities here. Then why are Chinese colonists to be placed under a ban? Are we an inferior race? No one can say so who knows anything of our history our language, our literature, our government, or our public and private life. Less than 15 years after the pamphlet's publication, the first of a suite of restrictive and racist laws that we now know collectively as the White Australia Policy were enacted in Australia. It would persist in effect until the 1970s. This led to a series, uh, the White Australia Policy wasn't the first time such laws were mooted in this country. It was just the first time they actually succeeded. When similar laws were first put before the New South Wales Parliament 50 years earlier, they'd been roundly rejected by the politicians of the time. That rejection led to a series of violent incidents on the goldfields known as the Burringong Affair and the Lambing Flat Riots, 
where more than 2,000 European miners attacked the Chinese, bludgeoning them, cutting off their queues, and forcibly ejecting them from the gold fields. Both of these incidents were larger and more politically charged than the Eureka stockade that came just a few years earlier. But while Eureka lives on in our cultural memory, the lessons of Burrungong and Laming Flat have barely been interrogated, nor have they been learned from. That's not entirely due to a lack of trying. In 1927, a group from Young near Laming Flat produced a silent film called The Birth of White Australia. I've seen it and I cannot say I recommend it. <laughs> It's full of yellow face and it tells the story of evil Chinese cheating, stealing and attacking women until the brave European miners stood up to them and drove them from the gold fields and ultimately from Australia entirely. It's a work of fiction presented as fact, an attempt to rewrite Australian history more than 60 years after the events happened and deep in the throes of the white Australia policy, the violent mob that waged a racist attack against Chinese miners is cast as the heroes. We might not think the white Australia policy affects us to this day, but it does. So much of Australian history was rewritten at that time. That revisionist history has created in us a sense of identity that few of us care to question. But the white Australia policy was devastating for Australia's future, crushing our economic growth, particularly after the Second World War, at a time when other countries were benefiting from a post-war economic boom that we now call the golden age of capitalism. Some of you might have heard me speak before about what Australia might have been if we'd been able to take full advantage of that growth. But aside from impacting our future, more importantly, the white Australia policy took from us our true past. Nearly every part of the country was named in that period in commemoration of pastoralists, politicians, merchants, even convicts, but only if they were English. People like Louis Almoy and Lo Kong Meng were some of the most prominent citizens of Australia at the time of its federation, but you won't find suburbs or streets or electorates named after them. Their contribution to our nation is all been but erased from the Australian story. The myth of a nation built solely on English, uh, on English backs ignores the legacy of many of the people who did the work, the thousands of Asian migrants who physically built this nation's infrastructure and industry by hand, or the merchants, financiers and industrialists who underpinned our economic establishment, or thinkers like Chok Hong Chong, who wrote on concepts of justice and human rights in this country as we understand them today to be Australian values. I have to be quite honest with you, I, there is absolutely nothing more tedious to me than speaking about racism and, and its effects, and I truly wish I didn't have to do it. But I can't speak about the future of our relationships in Asia without acknowledging that these relationships already have a long history, warts and all. There are important learnings that we can take from this by looking at our history because there's a clear commonality between all of the lowest points of our relationships between Australia and Asia. The Lambing Flat riots came at the end of the gold rush when the prosperity of the gold fields had all but run dry. The white Australia policy came about following the economic depression of the 1890s and persisted through two world wars and another depression, only to be rolled back 70 years later when prosperity returned. When Pauline Hanson gave her speech, it was 1996 after the recession of the 80s and early 90s, the steepest economic downturn in Australia since the Great Depression. Our housing, our housing crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic fomented Asian anti-Asian sentiment and hurt trade in our relationships with our Asian neighbours in ways not seen for decades before. Like an inconvenient sausage roll in a service station warming cabinet, the uncomfortable truth of our history is that while economic threats may not compare to the physical threats that Dunlop and his men faced, in times of madness and suffering, Australia has at times sought to isolate itself to its own economic detriment. And xenophobia has delivered easy victories to political parties, small and large, of every political stripe and on any issue of the day. This is a weakness we have to confront honestly as we come to know ourselves as a nation. But we also have to be honest about our strengths. And this is, I think, the heart of the real issue. This is not a speech about Australia's shortcomings, quite the contrary. I have great faith in Australia and in Australian people, and I know that our strengths as a nation vastly outweigh our moments of weakness. The noise of culture wars will try to tell us who we are and what we believe in, but they can't change what makes our nation what it is. In the past, we were told we were a white-only nation when we never were. We were told we had nothing in common with our Asian neighbours when we share a long history together. This is a country built on its willingness to engage with Asia, 
Migrants came here to mine gold. They came as carpenters, laborers, built telegraphs and railroads, founded businesses, had families, made lives for themselves. As we've heard, we've had indigenous trade ties with Asia that predate colonialism by centuries. Yes, the Lambing Flat riots came at the end of Gold Rush, but it was in response to racist legislation that was defeated. And when the rogue miners attacked, the Australian authorities were stood squarely on the right side of history. Yes, we enacted the White Australia policy, but we shouldn't forget that when the Chinese Question in Australia was published, making the case against it, it ran in major newspapers around the country, and its appeal against racism and for human rights received enormous support from Australian people of every colour. It was only in the face of overwhelming economic fear a decade later that we lost our heads and with it our political will. Yes, Pauline Hanson's speech made headlines around Australia and in Asia, but she was denounced from the Prime Minister down. MPs walked out from that speech in protest and she'd been disendorsed even before the election took place. The following year, the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, gave this very lecture calling for better relationships with our Asian neighbours. And one of Pauline Hanson's most vociferous critics, the then Deputy PM Tim Fisher, gave this same lecture a decade later. There's one thing I should correct from my introduction, and that's that I don't believe Australia embracing Asian food is a stepping stone to building better relationships in Asia. Our love of Asian cuisines in Australia is the result of those relationships that already exist and have done so for centuries. In the various soft power and diplomacy roles that I hold, I spend a lot of time traveling Asia. I cook with students at Indonesian universities. I give speeches in Vietnam. I read grant applications for Japanese dance troops who want to visit our country. I make TV shows in China, and I look at Australian-led child nutrition initiatives in Myanmar. And I can tell you firsthand, face to face, that these are deep, strong relationships. I speak with people who've studied here, who've sent their children to study here, who know Australia well and know our character well. These relationships now go back two or three generations without the white Australia policy that might have been six or seven. And it's on these multi-generational ties that our relationships with Asia will continue to build. Just like spaghetti bolognese can be our national dish without us ever deciding it to be so, by looking scientifically, forensically and honestly at our country and its history, we can know that our relationships with our Asian neighbours will continue to prosper. We're a wealthy nation rich in resources. We're a destination of excellence for education. We're a stable, safe and welcoming country. We have cultural ties to Asia and a history that spans generations. And we're a nation that wants peace, stability and prosperity in our region. Of course, we still need to do the work and it might, not, it might be that we don't know the specifics that our future relationships with our, with our Asian neighbours and how that will look. That's for the think tanks, diplomats and policy wonks. But the, with the truths of our nation undeniable, we know that those relationships will be strong and they'll be positive, as long as we don't forget the conditions that we have seen can distract us from those truths and which have done so repeatedly in our history. If Dunlop's legacy is anything to teach us, it should be that in those words of Stuart again, when difficulty comes upon, when difficulty comes upon, upon us, as it surely will. Australia will need to avoid the mistakes that we have made in the past and recognise that we can, should and, be, should and must be, as Dunlop was, a lighthouse of sanity in a universe of madness and suffering.